Well, the title of the book is going to be called Louis Armstrong's Laxative and 100 other mostly true stories about a life in the music business. What I can talk about is the nature of stories and how they change with telling, with your memory. There is a lovely Louis Armstrong story about him coming back from Europe uh, in the plane from a State Department tour, and he was sitting next to then Senator Richard Nixon. They had a wonderful flight because both of them were huge sports fans. They were into baseball and basketball and football, whatever. So they had a great flight. As they were coming down the stairs, which you did in those days from the plane, Armstrong turns to Nixon and says, Senator, I, I'm, I'm a bit tired. Would you mind carrying my horn for me? And of course, Senator Nixon carried Armstrong's trumpet case through customs, including, of course, the generous stash of weed that was in the trumpet case. That's how Louis got his, his dope back into America. <laughs> Toronto was the most boring, awful city in the universe. The second tallest building was the Royal York Hotel. But music? There were bars on Jarvis Street. Aye. There were astonishing artists. Black artists played Toronto all the time because there was no hassle for them. There was none of the crap that they were used to when they played in the States. So I stayed. In the early 60s, I'd met Buddy Guy, Sonny Land Slim, and I'd started bringing them into Toronto to do shows. I had become seen as an expert in blues. And I'm at a folk festival. And I had no idea what they were, but that weekend I met Gordon Lightfoot, who I actually had met before, uh, Phil Oakes, Buffy St. Marie, Ian and Sylvia, I still wear cowboy boots because Ian Tyson wore them at that festival in 1965 and I thought they were the coolest thing in the world and I've never worn anything else since. Meeting these people, hearing this music was like, was it Isaac Newton who got hit in the head with an apple and figured out gravity? So after the folk festival experience, I was involved in bringing Buddy Guy in, Howling Wolf, Muddy Waters for a week. Uh, and the first time he'd ever been in Canada. I never liked the Beatles very much. I thought John Lennon did a really shitty Little Richard impersonation. So I start doing publicity for individual artists, and I discover I have a kind of eye and ear for new people. I'm convinced of their quality, of their talent, of their focus, their ambition and their energy to get there. So I tell stories and lots of people suggest I write them down. The question is, how do you find the time to do that? I was very doubtful about this crowdfunding thing. It's odd. And then I thought, you know what? Count Brandenburg paid Bach some good money so he could write five lovely concerti for him. 500 years later, we're still listening to them and loving them. So I'm asking people to support this project, and they will, of course, get copies of the book, and there'll be a launch, and there'll be a limo ride, and there'll be all sorts of nonsense in, in prizes. If I ask for, say, $15,000, that will allow me to let my assistant run my business, uh, and I'll just go away and type and put all these stories down, the sad ones, the funny ones, the goofy ones, and um, people you shouldn't have messed about with. <laughs> so this book is a summary of a hundred mostly true, okay, so I call Alice Cooper, right, at his home. He answers the phone. 
somewhat exaggerated. So I ran really fast, got in, showered, changed back, slightly altered the piss take on the new Christy minstrels, or the new crusty nostrils, we used to call them, <laughs> about, you know, a life in this, in this music business. The funniest was Billy Connolly. Guess what? I've won for my documentary on lesbian prostitutes in Glasgow. You can do it like so, and it reads, turd. 